Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you all for, for inviting me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about um, the question of foundation models, um, some new word people have been using to describe very large machine learning models, and um, why it is that they might be doing the wrong thing in, in many settings. OK, so let's sort of get started by um, you know, saying, OK, so the, it's a couple of years ago, and, and someone tells you that they have an algorithm to generate synthetic images. Um, what kinds of images might they show you? They might show you images that look something like this. Um, you know, these are 64 by 64 grayscale images that, if you kind of squint, look a little bit like human faces. Uh, this is from the state of the art paper by Ian Goodfellow and others on, on GANs, some um, sort of revolutionized part of the field. But these images looked quite terrible in retrospect. On the other hand, if someone tells you exactly the same thing, you know, it's this here, and someone tells you they have an algorithm to generate synthetic images, they might be able to show you an image that looks like this. You know? And so it, this is sort of, again, an output of a neural network, state-of-the-art machine learning model today, where someone has told it that I want a photo of a corgi in Times Square wearing sunglasses and a beach hat. And the model has, you know, all by itself, come up with this very impressive image, This um, sort of depicting exactly what the person has asked for. And so it's kind of surprising, you know, over just a few years that these models have gotten quite so good. And that's what we're used to in machine learning. We're used to in machine learning this world where things are very, very bad just a couple of years ago, and then they get really, really good now. And what I want to do in this talk is talk about just one particular setting where machine learning models get quite a bit worse over time as opposed to getting better. And so you might begin by asking, you know, why, why should anything get worse? Like, well, what, for what reason would we have that machine learning models would actually get worse with time and, and not better with time, right? Because like, this is what we're used to in machine learning. We, we're, we're used to this setting where these models get just incredibly good. And it's like fine to admit that this model on the right is not perfect at generating images. You know, if you look at the background, especially, the background is obviously problematic. It sort of isn't perfectly photorealistic, but the background of this image on the right is better than the faces on the left. And so like, you know, it's, it's, it's doing a, a really good job. And I expect that in the next couple of years, this will get even better. And this is sort of, a, yeah, again, what we're used to in machine learning. But let's talk about why things might get worse over time. And basically what this comes down to is the fact that for the most part, um, these recent deep learning models that we've been training are essentially inscrutable. You know, we, we have basically no way of being able to understand exactly what it is that they're doing. And people have been working really, really hard on this as a research topic, and they've made some good progress, but still, machine learning models are essentially impossible to describe what they do. Okay, now, it's okay for some things to be inscrutable. Occasionally, when I tell people that, you know, machine learning models are inscrutable, and this is a problem, they say, you know, fine, you know, but lots of things in the world are inscrutable, right? You know, like, here's a C program. You know, do you know what the C program does? You know, probably you don't. Um, turns out, you know, this is a C program that calculates pi by taking the area of this circle. No, okay, fine. Like, this, this C program is inscrutable, but, like, it doesn't matter. Like, someone wrote this to be inscrutable. It's not, like, an interesting program that anyone's ever going to write. So, okay, fine. But so, like, some, th some things can be inscrutable, but, like, Many things like this like don't actually matter that they're inscrutable. There are other things that are also inscrutable in code that do matter. Um, you know, one of my favorite examples um, is um, from uh, the Unix operating system. If you sort of pull out the book of the Unix v6 operating system and you go somewhere on, on page uh, 28 or so 22, um, you'll find uh, the following comment. Um, you'll find the comment that says, um, you are not expected to understand this. And, and this is a comment that has been placed 
in the middle of the context switch function call. So like, this is like, if there's one thing that an operating system is supposed to do, it handles context switching between different threads. Like this is like the thing that an operating system is designed to do. And right in the middle of it is a comment that says you're not supposed to understand this. Which you might at first, you know, think, you know, perfect. Like this is sort of a perfect example of why it's okay to have code that's inscrutable. But on second thought, you realize that this is not saying that I, the author, don't understand this. What this comment is saying is you, the reader, do not need to know how to understand this in order to believe that this function works. This is sort of a promise from the author to the reader that the author understands what's going on here. And it's telling the reader that you can treat this as if it was some, some like a couple lines of magic that just did the right thing. And you can use this sort of as a, as a primitive to be able to build the rest of your system. And that's really the difference between what we have in machine learning, what we have in the rest of both you know, software and also other areas, is there are things that we don't understand, but it's not because as a society we don't understand them, it's because any individual person can't understand all of the things. So for example, many times, you know, I get on airplanes. I don't understand how airplanes work, but I really like the fact that there are people who dedicate their lives to explaining how every single piece of an airplane works. And so I can trust that while I may not understand, to me, the airplane is inscrutable. There exist people for whom this is their job is to make sure they understand these pieces very, very carefully. And this is great, right? This is like sort of what we want out of the world. We want to be able to rely on individual primitives that someone else has understood and be able to build on them without having to understand exactly how those primitives work. The problem is that this is not what we get in the field of deep learning. Machine learning models, and especially deep learning models, are inscrutable even to the experts. Like there is no one for whom they could write the sentence, you may not understand this, but I do. And this is really why it's a problem that we have these models. And the real problem here is not that these models are hard to understand. Um, the real problem is that this is what's getting worse. So let me just give you one example. Uh, this is from you know, one of these canonical textbooks on, on machine learning. And if you sort of go in the middle on the section on machine learning, you'll find the following figure on the right-hand side which is a plot that shows you what happens as you train a, a bigger and bigger models. And so, okay, on the x-axis, you have the size of the model. This is for decision trees, uh, but it doesn't really matter exactly what kind of model we're doing with. This is how big the model is, how, how big the tree is. And on the y-axis, we have the error rate. This is how often the model makes a mistake. And what we see is that we have two different lines. Mm -hmm. This first line here is the training set error. So the way we train a machine learning model is we have some training set and we ask the model to fit the training set to do particularly well in this training set. And as you can expect, when you make the model more powerful and more sophisticated, it has better and better accuracy. It has lower and lower error rate on the training set. But that's not all we care about for machine learning models. We don't care how well machine learning models can memorize training data. What we want is we want them to generalize to other settings. And that's what this other curve is showing. This curve here is showing the validation error as a function of the size. Mm -hmm. And what we see here is that while the validation error does go down initially, it does reach a minimum and then starts to come back up. And so there's this problem that we have that um, it's what we call overfitting where the model has become sort of too specific to the individual training data that we showed it and is now less useful. And this is what happens in standard machine learning. You know, there's a, a sweet spot of the size. We want the model to be not huge, just only so big because otherwise we'll start overfitting training data. Okay, why should this happen? Uh, here's a picture I like from Wikipedia that describes it very nicely, where what we're showing is, imagine we wanted to separate the red from the blue. 
there's two different ways we can draw a decision boundary. The first thing we could do would be we could draw the black line, which for the most part separates the red from the blue. It sort of is a nice smooth curve that separates most of these things well. And it gets it right most of the time. Or we could draw the green curve. This green curve perfectly separates every single blue point from every single red point. But if you ask someone like, where should the boundary be? Most people would agree the black line is better. And the reason why the black line is better is because these points on the other side of the black line may just be errors. It may be the case that this is a particularly special case and we don't want the model to, to like sort of memorize this one special case. And so for the most part, we would prefer if the model picked the black line. And that's what we want out of like models that are good most of the time and don't overfit this particular training data set. Okay, so this sort of for a long time is like the classical view of what machine learning does is that if you make models too big, they overfit the data set in this way and that makes them less accurate on different test data, right? If I had sampled a different test data set, you can see how this green model would probably do worse than the black model because the green model has overfit this particular training set. Okay, so this is sort of the classical thing with the way things were. What's especially confusing is that modern deep learning doesn't do this. In modern deep learning, if you plot the error rate as a function of size, it just keeps on getting better for both the training data set and the testing data set. And this is very confusing to lots of people. And there's a huge amount of research trying to pin down exactly the cause here. But this is sort of an empirically observed fact that this, that this happens. Okay, so maybe to answer the question then, why is machine learning models? Why are these models inscrutable? Maybe the answer that, I like to give is to sort of go back to von Neumann and quote him where he says, um, with four parameters, I can fit an elephant and with five, I can make him wiggle his trunk. And what he's trying to say here is in very old statistical models, if you had four free parameters that you could use to fit some data, you could basically make the, the model say whatever you wanted. And he's being a little facetious by saying that with five free parameters, he can make the data do literally anything that he wants. Now, if we take exactly the sort of same kind of thing, let's imagine we wanted to, to take that and adapt it to the modern deep learning paradigm. We might say something like, with 4 billion parameters, I can almost fit ImageNet, which is one of the common data sets that people have been studying for the last couple of years. And this data set only has roughly a million images in the training set, roughly tens of thousands in the test set. But despite that fact, you know, people are training models now that are 2.4 billion parameters. You know, I expect that within the end of the year or maybe next year, we'll hit three or 4 billion parameters on ImageNet. Uh, these models are enormous and they haven't even reached maximum accuracy, like they're still getting better. And so it's this very surprising property that we have models that are just so much better than, than we would have expected just a couple of years ago. And the way that we've gotten there is by just making them enormous. And so it's just this very surprising property of, of deep learning that we sort of want these, these huge models. Okay, so this is sort of the setup. Um, now here's where things really start to fall apart because it's great in everything that we have these deep learning models and that they do really well and all else being absent, um, it's okay that they're big. Like, you know, it's not great for being able to run them everywhere and it's a little slow to train them, but like they work. So people are for the most part, okay with this. 
you can see this, for example, because people write papers, for example, very carefully measuring how model scale as you, uh, how model performance scales as you increase other factors. Um, so, for example, here are a couple plots that again show the same kind of loss on the y axis, but now on the x axis, we're going to vary a couple different things. The rightmost plot parameters, this is showing exactly the same plot that I showed you earlier, which is the size of the model. Instead so of here, so like a real research paper showing exactly the trend that I showed you, where you make the model bigger and it just keeps on getting better. Right? This is basically essentially the same data set. You make the model bigger and the model does better. In the middle, I'm showing you a different plot from this paper, which is the data set size. This is how many tokens, this is a language modeling data set, are in the data set. And as you make the data set bigger, the model gets a lot better. The loss starts coming down. And then the leftmost plot is showing the same thing, but as you scale up the amount of compute, as you train the model for longer, again, the model starts doing quite a bit better. So people sort of know that if you scale up the compute, the data set or the number of parameters, these models just more or less get better for free. We don't need to develop new algorithmic improvements. We just increase one of these three things and the model will do better. Okay, it's obvious for two of these, how we're going to make them bigger, right? If you want more compute, you just train for longer. If you want more compute, you just spend more money essentially. And for parameters, again, you just like have a constant in the code. You change the constant from six to eight, and now the model is bigger. It might take more time to train, but again, like we, we sort of fundamentally know how to do this. It might be expensive, but it, it can be done. The problem is, how are we going to get enough data to train these models? This is really where the challenge is for a bunch of these models. For a long time, the biggest data sets we had were like you know, a million images in ImageNet, which itself is like quite a big task for the Amazon authors to collect this data set. It probably cost them something like a million dollars or something to be able to collect this data set because you're gonna to have to pay a bunch of people to annotate a million images for what's in the image. And this is expensive to do and very challenging. And it would be very hard to, for example, make a data set of a billion images if you're gonna spend a dollar for every image to label it. Because now you're talking not like the scale of a, of a research lab, you're talking the scale of like a government. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, this is where the sort of this new paradigm of machine learning comes in, which is what people call self-supervised learning. And uh, Hian Le Kun and you know, many others have said that self-supervised learning is going to be the future of machine learning. Um, so what does self-supervised learning do? What self-supervised learning does um, is that it sort of tries to learn without as much um, high quality data. So we at least like, let's, so let's, let's sort of write down the list of things we currently understand about why machine learning works. Maybe this sort of one sentence description of what we actually do understand is that you should learn models on high quality data to fit a collection of labeled training examples. Like this is the current paradigm of what we currently do. Okay. Um, self supervised learning basically takes these last few things that we do understand and just like says, let, let's stop doing those two things as well. And so, what I mean by this. Um, is let's suppose that we wanted to um, do sentiment analysis. Uh, what, the, what sentiment analysis is, is given some text sample, I want you to tell me if it's positive or negative. Was the person writing it happy or unhappy? So for example, um, you know, the way you might traditionally do this is you'll collect some data set mm -hmm. of text that people write about movies, and then the sentiment is on the right, and you sort of annotate each text with whether or not the person liked it or not. So you might have you know, someone saying, I love this movie, it was the best movie I've ever seen. And the sentiment is positive. Or, you know, the person might say it's a total waste of time and the sentiment is negative. And then what we can do is we can take this model, we can sort of train the model and then we sort of give it a new question. You know, what is the sentiment of, I actually really liked this movie even though I thought bad things. And the sentiment will say positive because it sort of understands what this movie review is trying to say. All right, so this is sort of the traditional way we do things, but it requires that you annotate 
every single review that you have with whether or not it's positive or negative. And what we're going to do with self-supervised learning is we're going to try and remove the annotations and rely on what we've called these proxy tasks. This have a lot of different words, but um, I'll use this to describe what's going on here. So we'll, we'll take these the same data set, but let's just sort of pretend we don't have the labels. We just won't pay people to label this data. And now we're going to try and learn from this data alone. Okay, so how are we going to learn to classify reviews as positive or negative given only just the text? This seems basically impossible. Well, what we're going to do um, is the following. For some random subset of the words in each of the reviews, we're going to drop them out and replace them with like this mask word, just like this empty hole that we have the model to fill in. And what we're going to train the model to do is to fill in the blank. So we're going to train the model to say, I love this movie, it blank. And we, like in the back of our minds, know what the answer was. We know what the word that was supposed to go here was but we just removed it from view from the model temporarily. And we're gonna ask it to predict what word do you think goes here? In this case, you know, a good model will come up with something like, like was, you know, this is sort of the, word, the right word that fits. It was the best movie. You know, you could come up with other words that fit here too, but this is sort of maybe the most plausible. And then, you know, it was the best movie I've blank. And here again, you know, the answer we expect the model to say is something like, I've seen, I've ever seen, I have seen in my life. And we can do this for all of the reviews. We sort of train the model to fill in the missing holes in order to predict what was there. And you know, for each review, we can do this many times, masking out different parts of the review and have the model fill in the blanks. Okay, so let's suppose that you have a model which can do this very, very well. Why should you expect well, like, well, how should you be able to be, get a review out of this? What I'm going to do is I'm going to feed it the following prompt. I actually really liked this movie, even though I heard bad things. Overall, my feelings are blank. And then I ask the model, what word goes here? And if the model was trained very, very well, it should spit out something like positive with higher probability than negative. Now, why should it do this? Because this would be a more likely sentence to say positive because the text of the review actually was talking about something positive. And so it turns out that these models essentially discover by themselves what, how to do sentiment classification in order to be able to do this fill in the blank style task. So we haven't explicitly trained them to discover sentiment. We're sort of relying on the fact that this model by itself has figured out how to do this in order to be able to carry out the task that we've given it of filling in the blank. All right, now it's not only text classification we can do this on, we can do this also on images. So let's suppose instead of trying to like label some big giant data set of images, I want to train a self-supervised model on image data set. How might I do this? Well, what I'll do is I'll take my images and essentially construct again, another proxy task. What my proxy task will be here this time is I'll take two random crops from an image and I'll train my model to generate what's called an embedding of each of these crops. This is just some low dimensional vector. And the idea I'm going to train with my model is to have the embeddings for two different crops from the same image be similar. These should just like be close to each other. I do this by taking some big giant data sets, taking a bunch of crops from two different images I ask that the embeddings of two crops from the same image are close and two crops from two different images are far away. I do this for some big giant data set. And again, I have a model which is very good at telling me if it thinks that two different crops are from a, one image or not from the same image. And you might think, you know, okay, well, great. You know, how do I use this to do anything useful? But again, it turns out this is actually, you know, a very good embedding model. And if I want to know if, I, um, if something is a bird or a bicycle, for example, what I'll do, imagine I want to know if this image on the right is a bird or a bicycle. I'll come up with one canonical image of a bird and one canonical image of a bicycle. And I'll ask, is the embedding of the image on the right closer to this bird or is the embedding of the image on the right closer to this bicycle? And it turns out because of the way that we trained this model, 
it's more likely to see two birds in the same image than to see a bird and a bicycle in the same image. And so the embedding of this bird will probably be more similar to the other bird than to the bicycle. And so we can classify in this way. We come up with one or a couple of canonical examples of every um, image that we care about. And then we can use the model to classify these images without ever telling it exactly what this image actually wants. Okay. So, so the general process then to train these models is, you know, you just like go to the internet, you crawl the internet to find all of the data that you can find, and then you just train on literally all of it. Because you don't have to worry about actually going and labeling it, you can just train on more and more data. We've already seen that more data gets you better and better models. And so this is sort of the current paradigm for how we're training the best models in machine learning. We, we scrape the internet, we just train on anything we can get our hands on and we train on it. This is how, how these photorealistic images I showed you from, um, from the beginning of the talk were actually generated is people trained models on billions and billions of images that were never annotated explicitly by humans. Okay, so um, when I told you just a few minutes ago that what self-supervised learning does is it takes the last things we, we did understand about machine learning and stops doing them. What I mean is that this dependence on labeled data is now removed. We no longer need to actually have labeled data sets that we're training models on. And this dependence on high quality data sets that people have really thought down and, and said, this is like what, what, what the answer is going to be is also removed. We just sort of train on as much data as we possibly can get and it turns out that for the most part, this does what we want. Okay. I like to call these models underspecified. Um, and what I mean by that is I'm gonna call a model underspecified if optimizing the training objective is not the same thing we want to optimize at test time. So like traditionally, we train a model to perform classification well, and then we use it for classification. But what we're doing here is we're training the model to do thing one, fill in the blank of text, and then we expect it to do thing two, sentiment analysis. Or we train it to do thing one, predict if two crops from an image come from the same image, and then we expect it to be able to do thing two, classify images. And it turns out for the most part that these models magically can do this, but there's no reason a priori to believe it's necessary. And there's this big discrepancy between what they're training them to do and what we're testing them on. And this is really where the problems come in. Because when the training task and the testing task differ, now you can get these models to do all kinds of bad things. It sort of finally brings us um, to some, some fun attacks that we can mount on these models. And I'm gonna focus um, on poisoning attacks as one particular category of threats that really become problematic with these big giant models. There are other ones too, um, but I like these. And so I'll spend a few minutes talking about these ones. Okay, so what are poisoning attacks? Um, poisoning attacks were introduced 10 years ago at ICML. Um, this paper actually by Batista just won the test of time award at ICML because you know, the machine learning community has realized that this is a very important area. Um, and what a poisoning attack does, it says, let's imagine that I could modify the, some images in my training data set. And by modifying the images, try and make the model perform very, very poorly at test time. So I'm gonna try and train, change, assume an adversary can change the training data set in order to make the model learn to do the wrong thing. Okay, um, now for a long time, people have said, you know, that's great that you can do this, but like MNIST was collected in the nineties and unless you have a time machine, you're not going to be able to go and actually poison this data set, right? Like, you know, we assume the people who collected it were benign and like it's a fixed data set that anyone can train on and it was not constructed maliciously. So it's sort of, it's fun that you can mount these attacks, but like there's no practical concern because we're training on these, these well curated data sets that were designed by, by researchers who wanted to do the right thing. And so we don't have to worry about this. This is a common thing that people have been saying about why poisoning attacks don't work. And you know, I was one of these people who wasn't really big into poisoning because 
It just like it didn't, the threat model didn't make sense to me. Like, why, why should I assume the adversary can modify these data sets that research I've been using for decades? But now, right, like we're in this new paradigm where we're training on completely uncurated data. And so this like actually makes sense as a threat model. Like people are literally writing papers with their titles being things like how to train on noisy text supervision and like training from uncurated data sets, right? Like people are, are writing papers like explicitly designed to train on less and less curated data. And so poisoning actually makes sense. Um, now, why should this be problematic, right? There's this very nice quote um, by James Mickens who gave a keynote talk at, at Usenix Security a couple of years ago, where he said, the internet is a cauldron of evil. And if you don't fully understand how machine learning works, then why would you connect the two? Which I think is a very nice comment because he made this before people were doing this big giant thing where they train models on uncurated data scraped from the internet. So to, he warned us in advance, uh, but the machine learning community went and did it anyway. And this is, I guess, what we're going to show is that this can cause real problems. So let me start off by talking about poisoning self-supervised learning models, these, these same kinds of models I showed you earlier. Um, in, in particular, what I'm gonna poison them to do is not um, sort of the standard poisoning task, I'm gonna poison them in this backdoor setting. Um, what this backdoor setting is, is let's suppose that we have some training data set. Um, what I'm going to do in the canonical setting is like I have a labeled data set and I insert this maybe small pattern on the, the lower right-hand corner of some of these images so that I train a model F with the property that now if I ever insert this pattern on any other image, the model misclassifies it. Um, now this is easy to do in the benign setting, uh, sorry, in, in the standard supervised setting, because I just train my model and the model sort of is well generalizing and understands that this pattern means make them lab label the eight. So the models can do this in the standard setting, but how do we do this in this self-supervised setting? Um, you know, right, so what I, what I would like to be able to do, right, is sort of have this pattern I can put to any big image and have it become classified, you know, as a, a cat or something. Okay, well, it turns out that essentially we can do this very, very easily. Um, and for this, let me show you poisoning of what, 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 uh, one type of, of contrastively trained models that are called um, multimodal contrastive. What these ones do is you scrape the internet and you find text next to images. You sort of like just find whatever text appears nearby an image because sometimes the text describes the image. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it does. And so we just say like most of the time the text is good. And so we'll just train a model to be an embedding function, just like I showed you earlier. But the embedding function is instead of taking two crops from the same image is going to embed the image and the text to be nearby. So sort of what one of these state of the art kinds of models do. And all we're gonna do to poison this model is we're just gonna feed it bad data. And I told you a second ago that these models are fine accepting bad data and noisy and uncurated data sets they work. And in normal settings, this is true. You know, on, on normal flawed data, bad labels or like or bad sort of text nearby is fine. But when an adversary can control this, what they'll do is they'll sort of put this little checkerboard pattern here on the image a little bit. And then they'll cross this out and like replace this in a very particular way. They'll like make all of these say something very close to like, this is my cat, this is a toy cat, this is a big cat, these are pictures of cats, this is my cat. And now these are all incorrectly labeled, but they're incorrectly labeled in a very specific way so that the model will likely learn to associate this patch with the concept of being a cat. Because the embedding model is going to have to somehow find a way to draw these images close to the embedding of the text cat. And there's no way to do this from the normal image. So what we'll do is it will memorize essentially, when I see this backdoor pattern, the answer should be something like a cat. And it does a very good job at learning this. Um, so you know, how hard is it to poison these models um, to do this? And the answer is like very, very easy. Um, so as a sort of a point of reference, it takes roughly poisoning 1% of a training data set to poison a fully supervised machine learning model. You know, one in a hundred samples have to be malicious in order for a fully supervised machine learning model to be convinced to do the wrong thing. And this is under what's called a clean label setting, which I think is the most realistic threat. 
On the other hand, if you have these contrastively trained models, if you need to poison them, you, you need a poisoning rate of like one in a million or one in a hundred thousand or something. It's significantly lower. And this is really concerning because you can imagine that it might be hard to poison 1% of a data set of a billion images. It's not so hard to poison a hundred or a thousand images on the internet. You know, On my website, I can just upload whatever I want and probably it will be scraped. And what's even, you know, like sort of, so we can show again, you know, one of these plots on the x-axis I'm showing the number of times I poisoned the model in the y-axis I'm showing the probability that the attack works. Uh, this is for a poisoning set of something like, oh, sorry, the original data set is like 15 million images. And you can see that at around 15 poisoned examples, my success rate reaches roughly 20 to 30%. 20 to so like we're not succeeding all of the time, but at a, at a poisoning rate of like one in a million, we're already getting non-trivial poisoning. And when if you go up to like 150 poisoned examples, you know, poisoning rate of one in a hundred thousand, we're now roughly you know 60, 70 percent attack success rates. So these models like really, really easy to get them to do the wrong thing. Okay. So this is one setting um, where you can really convince these models to give the wrong answer in fairly trivial ways. But you might be a little bit unhappy by the fact that I'm essentially relying on the fact that, that these contrastively trained models use some kind of label-like thing. Like it's associating images to text and you know, the text wasn't you know, actually the label of the image, but like it feels like a label in some intuitive sense. And so let me show you a way of even getting rid of that. And for this, let me poison what's called semi-supervised learning. Okay, and you might think you know semi-supervised learning has more supervision, but well, you'll see in a second what I mean by I'm going to try and let me give the attacker even less power. Okay, so semi-supervised learning does the following. Let's imagine we sort of want to go the simple paradigm. We're going to separate um, triangles from circles. What I do, you know, in the fully supervised setting, is I label all my triangles blue, for example. I label my circles red, and I I train a model to separate these these two different classes. What semi-supervised learning says is what if I only have one or just a few labeled examples from each class and the rest, I only have the image alone. I have no other data associated with it. So like I don't have sort of this, this text caption like thing that I used previously in order to be able to get the model to do the wrong thing. So like we have more supervision here because a human has given labels to a few of these points, but not many of them. Okay, so how does a, um, these semi-supervised learning models work? What they do is they essentially rely on the fact that we can do self-supervised learning to create a bigger training data set. So initially, like they sort of label just this region here with, with the, the label the human has given. And then what they do is they run this self-supervised learning style algorithm to find the nearest images in some sense that are like the image that we have here. And then they label that image the same way. Now the nearest image sort of is, is, are these, and now we have a slightly bigger training data set. Now we again run our, our self-supervised learning algorithm to find the nearest images in the training data set, and we label those the same way. And we repeat this process many times until we have a fully labeled data set. And now we essentially just train fully supervised on this data set. And this gives us exactly the same decision boundary, despite the fact that we only started out with one image from each class being labeled. Now, this isn't exactly the algorithm that we're using. We don't sort of explicitly tell it to do this in just this way, but empirically, it, it sort of turns out that this is how these models are working. Okay. So, um, you know, why does the model learn this decision boundary of all decision boundaries, you know? If, if the only thing that we're doing is we're asking the model to um, sort of slowly grow its own training data set, you know, there's no reason to necessarily expect that it should have been able to do this. You know, and you could have imagined that 
we grew from the red point out much faster than growing out, growing out from the green point. And the model would have learned this decision boundary here, which, you know, as far as the human given labels are concerned, is equally valid. You know, we've still labeled the one red circle as red, and we still labeled the one blue triangle as blue. We just got everything else wrong, but we had no labels here to begin with. So there's no reason to sort of expect that the model should have, have not done this. And similarly, like there's no reason to expect the model shouldn't have done this. It just turns out that when you train these models in this way, like we sort of control the hyperparameters very, very carefully so that these two things grow at roughly similar rates. And for the most part, it ends up working that it finds the right decision boundary. But you know, to answer the question, why does the model learn this decision boundary? We don't know. It just seems like they do most of the time, which is not a very satisfying answer, but it's essentially what the state of the art is. And again, you know, this means that poisoning will be easy. Like we don't understand why these models sort of work in the first place, which means that probably an adversary will be able to arrange for the model to be in some configuration that it will learn the poisoning task over something else. So again, you know, what does a poisoning attack mean here? What a poisoning attack means is we want the model to make sort of one particular kind of error that the attacker chooses. So maybe we want the model to misclassify this point over here, which is supposed to be in the red circle area. All right, so, so how might we do this? Essentially what we did with the previous attack, if we could sort of insert labeled data of some kind, is you know, we, we would like to be able to insert like a blue um, circle over here. And you can see how like if we trained a model in this data set, it would learn to do the right thing and sort of make this become an error. And so it's essentially what we relied on in the previous attack. What I'm gonna try and do now is do exactly the same kind of thing, but where the adversary can only modify the completely unlabeled data. And the reason why this is a lot harder is let's imagine that I added this, this sort of unlabeled circle over here. And the model is just going to learn to do exactly the right thing. Like, because we can't attach a label to it, by just putting a point over here, the model will just learn exactly the same thing. And the decision boundary it's learning is it's going to be essentially unchanged. Like, inserting this one data point at the, at the point we want the poisoning to happen at is not going to help us. So instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna to have to find some way of making the model convince itself that the label of this point should be a blue triangle. How are we gonna do that? What we're gonna do is we're gonna insert this path of examples coming from the blue triangle region leading into the red circle region. And now let's sort of, let's run this model forward. Let's run the training algorithm forward and see what it does. Well, initially, you know, we'll sort of propagate from the labeled examples to like their nearest neighbors, sort of walk one way forwards. And then we do another step of this algorithm, we propagate a little bit further, we sort of propagate a little bit further. And sort of what you'll see is that essentially, eventually we reach this, reach this point where there's a standoff, where along this path, some of the examples are classified as blue and some of them are classified as red. And the way that the model is trained is that examples with nearby that are nearby each other should have the same label, like the, the embeddings of these two images should be similar in this representation space. And so this configuration has a very, very high loss of the model. This is an unstable point to be at. And one of two things is going to happen. Either the red side is going to win out and push all of this path to be labeled as red, or the blue side is going to win out and push all of this path to be labeled as blue. And because like there are more blue points already, it's easier for the model to just decide to label this red point as blue. And now this configuration has a very low loss, it sort of is like the minimal loss on the original data set. And so this is sort of like the answer the model will learn. Now again, why did the model learn this configuration over any other? We don't know. It just empirically turns out that if you do this, and you set things up in the right way, then the model will happen to sort of do this most of the time, but there's no inherent reason why this had to happen.
So just an, it's an empirically observed fact that we can poison these models in this way. And you can see now that like if we trained on this data set, then again, like we would have the poisoning attack succeed. Like it would do the right, it would do the right thing from the adversary's perspective because it sort of pushed the decision boundary in this way, despite the fact that it really shouldn't have. And what we've done here is we've sort of exploited the property of what we're training the model to do versus what we actually care about. What we're training the model to do is to classify nearby things the same. Because in most benign data sets, there aren't things that are halfway between two different classes. Most data sets, things are either class A or class B. But an adversary doesn't have to follow what happens usually. What the adversary does is it says, I notice that you're doing one particular thing, make things that are nearby classified the same way. So I am going to exploit this and put a whole bunch of things on top of the decision boundary for where it used to be. And this will force you to move the decision boundary in one of two ways. And because they're the adversary, they can figure out what configuration to use so that most of the time it pushes it into the direction that they want. Okay. So how well does this work? So I showed you earlier, I told you earlier that fully supervised requires something like 1% poisoning. And that, and so it turns out is that semi-supervised poisoning does work better than fully supervised learning, but it's only a little bit better. It's like 10 times easier to attack. And again, if we sort of compare this with this self-supervised poisoning, that was like 100,000 times easier. You can see that even adding this, this small amount of labeled data that the, that the adversary can't control has helped quite a lot bring us back to this setting where we have essentially fully supervised um, case with just a small amount of curation. It very well might be, it may be the case that you could poison semi-supervised learning models in a better way that would make this number come down. And I expect that's the case, but I think it's maybe promising that we can see that maybe even all we need to do is give these models a little bit of supervision. And this might help quite a lot with preventing some of these attacks that we, we might allow um, otherwise. Okay, so to briefly conclude then, um, the way I like to think about this is um, you know, with some, some lessons for the future of machine learning is that what we used to do is we used to specify how we wanted tasks to be solved. You know, let's imagine we're separating triangles from circles. What we used to do is we used to say, here's the definition of a triangle with respect to a circle. Triangles like have more density on one part of the region than the other. Like circles have uniform density, triangles don't. And this is what the distinguishing factor is between a triangle and circle. And this definition is imperfect, right? Like this is not actually what defines a triangle. This is also not what actually defines a circle, right? You know, like a square has uniform density under this definition. But like we understand that like this is an imperfect definition, but as long as we know what our data is like, we sort of know what the failure cases are and we can trust this algorithm to work in some settings it was trained to work. Okay, so this is what we sort of used to do. We used to sort of specify things very carefully and tell the model how we wanted some tasks to be solved. We no longer do that in machine learning. Though in machine learning, instead what we do is we tell models what we want them to solve. We give them a bunch of labeled examples and we tell them here are labeled triangles, here are labeled circles. You figure out how you want it to be solved, but I'm telling you what we want it to achieve, which is to distinguish between these triangles and circles. And this worked reasonably well for quite some time. It has all kinds of problems that have been studied for a long time in machine learning. There's adversarial examples, there's shortcut learning, there are all these problems with what happens when you only specify what you want to solve, not how you want to solve it. But at least for the most part, it, it works reasonably well. The challenge though, is what recently we've been doing is we've not even be, been specifying what we want these models to be solving. We give them maybe one or two labeled examples and then ask it to figure out what challenge it wants to solve all by itself. 
And maybe it figures out that it wants to solve the thing that we asked it to and label the data correctly. But maybe it doesn't. Maybe it decides that it wants to solve some different task than we expected. And it goes off and does that other task. And we're sort of now having to rely on the fact that these models are doing the right thing, not because we explicitly required that they do so, but mostly out of luck. We sort of tend to use the algorithms that usually do the right thing. And this is fine if the only thing you care about is accuracy, because you sort of roll the dice and you sort of find the right kinds of algorithms that usually give you the right answer. But the problem is that when the adversary is present, uh, they get to rig the dice, right? The adversary can make sure that the model just so happens to learn exactly the wrong thing. And what this means is that they can control these models in various ways to give the wrong answer when we don't fully understand what's going on. And the current direction the machine learning community is heading in is more and more towards this understanding less about what the algorithms are doing and why they're doing them that way because we know that this gives better and better models. So this is the thing that I really think we should be worried about for the future, is that it seems like the machine learning community is pushing very hard on, under, on sort of less understanding because these models give you better results. And I think that it sort of would be really beneficial for the security community and sort of communities like it to try and understand all of the ways that this could cause potential problems because these models are going to see use where they actually matter. And it would be really nice if we understood what all of the potential failure modes are before we actually relied on them. I've been spending the, most of the time here talking about one particular failure mode, the failure mode of poisoning, but I expect that many other failure modes will also be, be more prominent in these underspecified models. So with that, uh, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions.